Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming to the penultimate CJS 1130 lecture series. I am Erin Brightwell, uh, faculty in Asian Languages and Cultures, as many of you know. And today I am delighted to be welcoming Dr. Rosemary Candelario from Texas Women's University, where she is faculty in the Department of Dance. So I met Professor Candelario, I was trying to figure this out, in 2011, I think, um, at a Butoh Symposium at UCLA. I was only really there as a curious non buto dancer, but one thing that struck me at the time was what seemed to be a divide between the academics who worked on buto and the people who were scholars and dancers and how they talked about and understood dance. Um, and it was in part because of this that I wanted to invite Dr. Candelario because she is someone who not, who not only works on buto, but who also works in and through Buto. And I think that brings to her work a really invaluable perspective. In addition to being an active performer and choreographer, she is also the author of several articles and book chapters, including, I guess, kind of a burst of publications in 2018. I'm just choosing the one with my favorite title, uh, Dancing with Hyper Objects, Ecological Body Weather Choreographies from Height 2018 of Sky to Into the Quarry. Um, I'm also happy to add that her first monograph, Flowers Cracking Concrete, Eco and Comas, Asian American Choreographies, came out in 2016, and it has been described as indispensable reading for those interested in the histories and practices of contemporary concert dance and in the luminous works of these internationally renowned artists. So as usual, my intro is getting kind of into the realm of the rhapsodic, so I'm going to wrap this up, and I will ask you to please join me in welcoming Dr. Candelario. Thank you. Good morning. Still, still morning, I guess I can still say that for a little bit. Can you hear me okay? Uh, well, thank you, Aaron, so much for that lovely introduction, and um, I just also want to thank uh, Barbara Kinzer and everyone at the center for making this such a wonderful trip. Um, and to everyone I've met so far and, and we'll get to talk to today, and I'm um, very thankful. In Ruth Ozeki's 2013 Booker Prize nominated novel, A Tale for the Time Being, two narrators, a young Japanese woman in her teens and a middle-aged Japanese American writer are linked across time and space through a journal tucked into a Hello Kitty lunchbox that is carried by ocean currents from Fukushima after the tsunami to a small island off the British Columbia coast. The journal is a material connection between not only the two women, but also between the places and times they inhabit. Moreover, it acts as a symbolic link between Japan and North America. If this small journal can make the voyage, so too does radioactive waste make its way through water and air currents. This tells us we cannot think of place only as what exists or transpires within its boundaries. We must also take into account the relationships of that place with other places, whether across a river or around the world. Like the journal in Ozeki's novel, I argue that the Japanese American artist Eiko and Koma make dances that are points of connection, or as geographer Doreen Massey calls it, meeting places of multiple trajectories across time and space. This is possible, I argue, because of the way Eiko and Koma treat the sites of their performances as key partners in meaning making. The choreo this choreographic move suggests it's not merely the dancing bodies that are significant, nor is it simply, as some theories of globalization would suggest, movement of capital or goods that expands or contracts space. It's more so the process of bodies forming relationships with sites, with cities, with nation states, and with each other that forges the meaning of a place. Massey identifies this as a, quote, reciprocity of multiplicity between the identity of place and the identities of multiply placed people, end quote. Eiko and Koma are New York-based Japanese dance artists who have for over 40 years now created works for the proscenium stage, outdoor sites, galleries, and the camera that address elemental issues of life, <clears throat> death, and rebirth. Their close and unsparing attention to nature, mourning, and human relationships to other humans, 
as well as the world around them, has won them prestigious awards, including Guggenheim, MacArthur, and United States Artist Fellowships, New York Dance and Performance Awards, which are better known as the Bessies, and Doris Duke Performing Arts Awards. And interestingly, they maintain their Japanese citizenship even though they've been permanent residents of the US for over 40 years now. So Eiko and Koma first met back in 1971 at Hijikata Tatsumi's Asbestos Hall in Tokyo. Um, this was a place at the time where people could show up at um, the Buto founder's studio and uh, after a small chat with him, could have free room and board there in exchange for performing pretty much nightly um, for him. Um, and they spent um, a couple of months there together. Um, they met when they were assigned to, to, to perform together. And after a couple months, they thought, we've learned what we can here. Let's go out on our own. So they started performing um, under the name Night Shockers. Um, and then um, also started taking classes with Hijikata's frequent collaborator, Ono Kazuo, who himself is a, a Buto legend in his own right. And they both could deserve their own talk. Um, so from uh, 1972 to 1974, Eiko and Koma decided that they, they wanted to get out of Germany and they felt like their dance was their way that they could start to explore the world. So they first went to Germany um, and they also um, toured in the Netherlands, uh, France, um, and even to North Africa. And importantly, in Germany, they won um, the 1973 Cologne Young Choreographers Competition, which was a pretty big deal. It was at that time a real um, uh, place for German modern dance uh, choreographers. So the fact that they um, were selected um, uh, really brought them a lot of um, fame and um, across uh, Europe and got them a lot of touring opportunities. So as they're performing, um, one audience member said to them, well, you must go to New York. Um, contact my cousin and she'll set it up for you. And I said, sure, mm -hmm, I'll contact your cousin. Well, that person's cousin happened to be Beata Gordon, who I'm sure some of you know, <laughs> is um, not only has a major um, role in the writing of the Japanese constitution, but was also the very long time director, a performing arts director for Japan Society and Asia Society in New York. So, um, wow, what a connection to make, right? So. Beata agreed to bring them to New York for one performance, um, and it was an instant success. All the major dance critics were there, and really um, it got them so many other opportunities to perform, so they said, this New York thing, is, this could really work for us. Um, so after that initial debut, um, they returned to Japan, um, made a new work, got all their paperwork in order, and came back to the US in 1977, and they've lived in New York ever since. Um, they instantly became part of the New York downtown dance scene um, and really have built their careers um, in the American dance context. So over the past 40 years, Eiko and Koma have choreographed dances for, the all, for all their simplicity, grapple with really monumental matters. Destruction and regeneration, relationships among humans and between humans and nature, and the stakes of being an artist in challenging political times. These artistic concerns have cycled throughout their body of work, extending over long periods of time and sometimes laughing, overlapping with other themes. And their work is very deeply informed by their participation in the 1960s student movement in Tokyo. They both, when they went to Hijikata studio, neither of them had dance background. They really both had been activists and were looking for some reprieve from the streets and sort of some other ways to be engaged with the questions they were asking as activists. So it's a big part of, of who they are. Um, but then also these formative encounters, as I mentioned, with Hijikata and Ono in Germany. They worked with one of uh, Mary Wigman's um, uh, assistants, Manja Schmiel. They met um, uh, Lucas Hoving, who had been a, a famous dancer with uh, the Ho Jose Ramon Company. And then once they came to the US, they also became close with Anna Halperin. So all of these different influences, including the New York um, uh, artistic community, have really become foundations of their work. And from all of these influences, they've developed a very singular performance technique and approach to choreography. So in my study of Eiko and Koma, one of the most remarkable things I've identified in is the way their choreography theorizes place as multiple and relational, bringing multiple embodied histories from geographically distant locations into the space of a dance, just like the lunchbox in Ozeki's novel. 
It's almost as if their dances are choreographed answers to Massey's question of whether, quote, in certain realms we could imagine aspects of other places as in a sense part of our own place and vice versa, a kind of multi-locational place, end quote. I find this is particularly evident in Echo and Coma's body of work that links the ground zeros of Trinity, New Mexico, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and Manhattan across time and space, particularly in dances such as Fission, Land, Offering, Raven, and Fragile, and those are all ones I'll discuss today. Um, Echo's current solo project, A Body in Places, continues to explore these transnational and transtemporal links and the implications thereof in the wake of the March 11th, 2011 earthquake tsunami and resultant meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, nuclear power plant. So my talk today, I'm gonna to trace this idea of the nuclear across their body of work over the last 40 years and arguing that in direct contrast to the impact and destruction suggested by Ground Zero, this body of work actually engages in a contingent joining of bodies with public sites to create a space that mourns, reminds, and sometimes even proposes the possibility of emerging from the multiple horrors of the nuclear age. So Fission is an early work of Echo and Comas. It's from 1979. And this photo you're seeing is um, actually from a uh, site a specific performance of it at the University of Hawaii. Uh, but normally it was performed on stages. Um, as you can see, they're covered in layers of wheat paste and white material and gauze. Um, and in the stage performance, they sometimes wore these spiky black wigs. So they might be in this piece bandaged humans or exoskeletal creatures. Uh, the costumes really depersonalize them and make them look almost indistinguishable. They become a kind of cellular twins or crusty amoebas. The dance itself is primarily about the struggle to stand. No sooner do the twinge performers rise to their feet than they topple over and over again. Their efforts sometimes become combative as one seems to momentarily dominate the other. Echo climbs on Coma's back, Coma sits on Echo's folded body. But these, never, these moments never last long before the next collapse sends them both tumbling to the ground, left to sort out their limbs and to try to rise one more time. Despite this precarity, they pass through a number of moments of striking solidity in the piece, such as when they stand facing the audience, their gaze unusually direct, right fists raised above their heads in a pose strikingly similar to protesters raising the black power salute. And later they tilt forward and across between a back attitude and a yogic at a dancer's pose. Their right arms balance out the lifted left foot and yet the impact of the image is as if they were attacking the audience their forward momentum and coiled energy evident even as they stand still. Their bodies seem to be vessels of, if not rage, then some kind of dangerous energy. They crouch but appear ready to spring. They hold their hands and fists. Echo and Coma's appearance as damaged creatures performing under the title Fission in the midst of an escalating Cold War and a growing anti-nuke movement led to powerful associations for the audience between their dance and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Reviews were full of words like catastrophe, nightmare, devastation, shattering, and survival. Dance critic Deborah Jowett's description represents the typical response. She writes, you can imagine them as victims of Hiroshima, as terribly damaged people. You can imagine them as life itself disintegrating, end quote. One article even declared in its headline, Dancer's performance is drama on nuclear anxieties. Beyond the title, imagery, and choreography, the fact that Eiko and Koma were themselves post-war Japanese nationals certainly underscored any perceived link to nuclear weapons. Eiko and Koma addressed this issue in an interview with a dance critic. It's worth quoting them in full to understand how they saw their work. And usually um, Eiko is the one who does all the interviews and things like that. So Eiko says, Politically speaking, especially because the title is fission, people might imagine this to be related to Hiroshima. But when we made that piece, we had no intention. We knew that we were giving that kind of message to people, but we tried not to emphasize that part too much. Because if a person is receiving that message, there's no way we can do anything stronger. I mean, to imagine what had happened after Hiroshima is enough. 
we don't have to deliver, so deliver some message. We don't want to conclude that message. We leave that up to the audience. We, know, we don't know any more than you do already about the dangers of nuclear things and aren't in a position to say, look, enough of this. But if someone is taking that message seriously, I'm glad to have had a part in it. But that's not where the dance lies on. This desire to leave the interpretation of their work open rather than convey a particular message is consistent across Akel and Coma's career. It's also consistent with their rejection of the dogmatism of the student protest movement and resonates with the larger trends towards postmodernist thinking that rejected unitary meaning. Nonetheless, it does not mean that Akel and Coma's works, including fission, do not have a political impact, nor that their own politics don't somehow suffuse the, their choreography. In fact, despite this disclaimer, Akel and, perform, uh, Akel and Coma performed fission at a number of benefits, including for Dancers for Disarmament and the Anti-Nuclear Dance Benefit Concert put on by the People's Anti-Nuclear Information and Cultural Committee. So clearly they were supportive of the anti-nuke movement and were willing for their work and this dance in particular to be used in its service. Uh, and before I go on, it's really important to, important to note that this association between fission with the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki actually predates the introduction of Bhutto to the US. So Akon Kalma, even though they come out of this tradition, don't use that word to call, to name their own work. And really the first um, time you see Bhutto being used as a word in the US is around the performances of Sankai Juku in uh, 1984, even though Ono and Daido Kudakan had performed before that, but they were kind of talked about as avant-garde dance or um, modern dance before that. So, um, so they're performing this before that all, before Bhutto becomes something that people are thinking about. But also once Bhutto be, began to be performed in the US, there also developed a very strong association between Bhutto and the bomb, um, both in the US and in Western Europe as well. Um, despite the fact that there's no, uh, nothing about Bhutto's history or technique or practice that is connected. Um, but that interpretation is really persistent and is often reported as fact. And in my book, which uh, uh, Aaron mentioned, uh, I discuss what I call a nuclear discourse um, that I think developed around Bhutto, as I said, beginning in the mid 80s, uh, in contrast with the earlier Kabuki discourse that Barbara Thornberry has um, theorized um, that she says established Japan as an ahistoric site of tradition with whom it was safe to do business. I argue that a nuclear discourse around Bhutto um, in, especially in the mid 80s, uh, served to reassure an economically depressed America that Japan, which was rendered somehow both post-apocalyptic and prehistoric by the bomb was no serious threat. So Eiko and Koma nearly forgot their 1980 performance event vision until 9-11 reminded them of their own modest attack on the Twin Towers. The event was a site-specific version of fission uh, on the Battery Park City landfill on the Hudson River at the southwestern edge of Manhattan. And uh, interesting, the, the land from that landfill was actually from the World Trade Center excavation. So when they were you know, creating that site, all the soil that they dug up there was deposited here. And for a number of years, it was used um, until it was developed um, for performances um, and many other things, I'm sure. Um, so there was a group called Creative Time that sponsored a program called Art on the Beach. So the beach was this landfill. Um, and I think the title Event Fission contains the sense of creating new life as in biological fission, uh, where one cell becomes two, but it also indicates some of the destructive potential of nuclear fission. So I'm just going to show you a little bit. This is just an excerpt from an site specific performance. Um, and so the audience was kind of at the bottom of the room, and there were also four bonfires there. This part of the group performed at the top of the room.
up there that before they started this section, um, Baker actually turns around towards the, the skyscrapers and raises her fist at the skyscrapers. It's probably the most political, uh, um, politically charged uh, gesture in their entire body of work. Um, and then this, this kind of movement here that you're seeing um, kind of escalates and gets bigger and bigger and they tumble off the cliff down towards the finance. But closer examination, I think, of the use of the white flag of surrender suggests that Eco Solo head on charge of the Twin Towers was not meant to succeed. Indeed, by turning around, by meeting coma, by struggling to negotiate a partnership, and then together planting their joint statement of surrender, the pair offers an alternative for how to strategically deal with an ongoing crisis. They choreograph a plan to attack by yielding the final image of them tumbling down the dunes and disappearing into a hole then is not a fall in the sense of a fall from grace or a collapse of ideals, but a joining with the audience who already stands watch below. The fires are like watch fires, but also a symbol of renewal of the creativity of destruction. What new thing will grow on this spot, this ground zero in reverse, this land created from nothing? After 9-11, the documentation of the site-specific performance took on new significance. Echo and Coma with their white flag are the ones who survived, not the seemingly unassailable towers. Echo and Coma choreographed Land in 1991 in collaboration with Native American musician Robert Mirabal, a lifelong resident of the Taos Pueblo. As part of the process of creating the piece, Echo and Coma visited Mirabal in New Mexico and the three artists then traveled together to Hiroshima, places where they mutually implicated in a nuclear age. And they actually performed a works in progress showing of land there at the Museum of Art. So land then connects the US and Japan through these physical sites of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Trinity, the location in southern New Mexico where nuclear weapons were tested prior to being deployed on Japan. In the evening length dance, Mirabal and another Native American musician join Eko and Coma on a stage covered with a canvas that echoes the colors and shapes of the desert. Sand, rock, and minerals are evoked in the colors and textures of the massive painting. Beginning lying curled on their sides facing away from one another, Eko and Coma slowly draw closer by minutely opening and lengthening their bodies until they meet back to back. One lying atop the other, they, they crawl downstage at a pace of a desert tortoise, only to later retreat back upstage side by side. Their minimal movements keep them connected to the ground and to each other for the duration of the piece until uh, near the end, which is a section I'll show you in a minute. Um, they seem not to be able to move except in cooperation with one another. Unlike in modern or postmodern dance where exploitation of the entire space is imperative, Eko and Coma only use a small part of the large set, as if to imply that their bodies, while materially linked to the land, cannot and perhaps should not occupy it all. Meanwhile, Mirabal establishes a ritual space by playing music derived from ceremonial tra traditions of the Taos Pueblo. He and his fellow musician move around the dancers playing the flute and drum. This choreography of dancers and musicians suggests a relationship between the two pairs despite the fact that they function in different realms. And this is just a short clip from near the end of the piece.
constructs a transnational space that asks how Japanese, Japanese Americans, and Native Americans can live in solidarity with one another, calling attention to the fact, surely no coincidence, that New Mexico and other southwestern lands celebrated in this dance were considered by the American government to be useless and therefore equally useful for containing Native Americans on reservations, interning Japanese Americans, and testing the nuclear bomb with the intent of using it on, on Japan. Persistent inequities, however, mean that intern Japanese Americans received reparations from the American government as part of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, but reparations for Native Americans have not been forthcoming. Land presents these multiple meanings and inequities together on one stage, holding them together without attempting to resolve them. Akon Koma's uh, young son, Shin, in the back. Akon Koma's 2002 site adaptive dance offering was performed in a series of Manhattan parks the summer after 9-11. Although Akon and Koma proposed the hour-long site dance before 9-11, uh, they reconceived the piece after the fall of the Twin Towers as an offering to the citizens of New York and an act of public mourning, even adapting their usual duet format to include South Asian American dancer Lakshmi Isola. Centered on a coffin-like set the size of a dumpster, filled with dirt and extruding branches that resemble bones, the dance enacts what Eko and Koma call a ritual of mourning and a generation. While their choreography leaves room for audience members to bring their own experiences to bear on the meaning making of their dances, Eko and Koma's strategic collaboration with the South Asian American dancer at times and places where such identities and allegiances challenge mainstream responses to 9-11 allows different histories to be brought into corporeal relationship with one another. I'm just going to let this play in the background. His uh, echo is uh, edited together um, parts of the dance from all the different parks. So I'll just let that play. So their performances pointedly did not take place at the site of the 9-11 attacks. And Ground Zero was actually visible from some of the performance sites, such as Battery Park City, which is actually now the developed area where they had performed event creation all those years before. Instead, the dance took as its location other sites, still green, still living, where people regularly gathered to publicly mourn, celebrate, pass the time, or just pass through. Eko and Koma choreographed Isola's presence in the piece in order to draw attention to the post-9-11 context in which Arab and South Asian bodies were targets of increased surveillance, particularly, but not only in New York. Under those circumstances, bearded brown-skinned men were spotlighted as terrorists, while women wearing headscarves or the hijab were seen as victims of anti-democratic, read anti-American regimes. While those bodies were hyper-visible in the call to war in Afghanistan in 2001 and in Iraq in 2002 and three. Other Arab and South Asian Americans, those who died in the Twin Towers, were detained and deported, or who were violently attacked, or left behind to cope with any of these situations, became for all intents and purposes invisible. While Isola's dancing body cannot begin to encompass all the complexity and diversity of those erased from public view, her presence argues at the very least that South Asians and those of Middle Eastern descent must be acknowledged and mourned as part of the dead. By choreographing a South Asian American body alongside their own in the political context of the time, Akon and Koma asked the audience to view not only the dance, but also their bodies as site-specific. While the glacial movement vocabulary is not racially marked, their bodies are, a fact especially significant in an age of legal racial profiling. 
That is, they call attention to the ways that Japanese and South Asians had been racialized in the U.S. historically and how that racialization was being modified after 9-11. We can read into this move a strategic essentialism that calls attention to their bodies in order to stage the corporeal stakes of moving and mourning in public in the age of the world. This in turn points to the history of U.S. immigration and military ties, calling to mind a time when Japanese and Japanese American bodies were themselves the focus of U.S. governmental efforts to go to the Furthermore, by signaling similarity between Oiko and Ozola and Costume, movement that's a very trajectory, the choreographers point to contemporary connections. For example, the way Japanese Americans living with a legacy of internment lent support to Middle Eastern and South Asian So in this case, Oiko and Koma present a civil process of being buried into a pension. In the case of offering the time and place of its performances, these public parks in Manhattan, less than that in 11, is a more detailed meaning. Such a multiplication of meaning across sites could be applied to it in the ground zero itself. The term was originally coined to describe the location on the surface of the earth, either above or below the explosion of a nuclear bomb with the experiments of the Manhattan Project and the bombing of Hiroshima being the first pieces of the phrase. Although a misuse of the term, the flat twin tower site was already being called at ground zero within hours of the attack. Certainly this double meaning evidences the replication of structures of power not necessarily apparent amidst the personal knowledge of the other server. In the earlier case, the aggression and destruction of ground zero was justified the most sensible act of revolution in some war, while the more recent attack was described as an act attack on our freedom and therefore a just obligation to initiate a war. But while we might see in the name ground zero the repetition of erased structures of power, offering could be seen as an example of challenging this government. In the midst of the country's buildup to the launch of the war in Iraq, Offering created a space for the most multiple ground zeros to be joined across time and place and more. And I should say that um, Ace and Coma are very generous with um, all of their video um, online. They're a very extensive uh, Vimeo channel, which is not typical for um, most dancers. A lot of dancers will really guard their video. And, take it off of YouTube the minute it shows up. So they're really very generous in sharing their videos. So if you want to see any uh, longer clips of any of these things, feel free to explore both their website and their Vimeo channel. So Eko and Kama revisited land almost 20 years later through the piece Raven. Unlike the vast, still, but life-filled setting of land, the 25-minute long Raven is centered in a post-apocalyptic set of scorched canvases lined with straw and dotted with piles of black feathers. Mirabal's ceremonial style drumming and singing initiate a ritual space, although in this burnt out landscape, a nameless ground zero perhaps, images of physical struggle abound. And it's just a very short clip from the premiere of this piece at Wesleyan College, or Wesleyan University. Um, so you can see it was in an exhibition. Um, so, when the lights come up on a prone echo, there's a strong impression that this is not the beginning of the dance, that this is a dance that has been going on for a long time. As you can see here in this video, her uh, efforts find her repeatedly splayed, her joints jutting at awkward angles. And when Coma later joins her on stage, his stuttering walk evokes an injured animal. The performers seem to have just barely survived sure destruction. Their interactions are halting and sometimes brutal attempts at connection that result in sudden collapses or awkward embraces. You can see this was hinted to a little bit at the end of land, but really was just a small part of it, whereas here it's really the focus. When they meet, the two of them, roles of aggressor and victim constantly shift and Eko and Coma flail about the space as it's disorienting or uprooted. 
yet the dancers determinedly mobilize exhausted limbs through familiar patterns, as if compelled by some unspoken responsibility. Even when they tumble to the ground, they cannot, and perhaps will not, allow themselves to rest. Buoyed by the urgency of Mirabal's soundtrack, they press on. Even images drawn directly from land, including the final pose of the two dancers lying head to head, bodies curled towards the audience, twitch with a nervous energy not evident in the original. If the 1991 dance was a rehearsal of American, Native American and Japanese solidarity, the 2010 version is a desperate joint cry of warning, characterized by Mirabal's drumming, which crescendos to a decisive boom. A raven, after all, is a symbol of portent, a messenger. Less than a year after the premiere of Raven on March 11, 2011, as you all know, a massive earthquake struck off the eastern coast of Japan's Tohoku province, triggering a devastating tsunami. In addition to killing thousands of people and destroying hundreds of thousands of buildings, uh, the tsunami ca caused major damage to reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, including a meltdown in three of the six reactors. Although Eiko and Koma have typically eschewed direct references to world events in their work, the Fukushima Daiichi disaster has resonated through their work in the years since 2011. And Fragile is one example of that. And again, you can see here how they like to play with similar themes and, and issues. Um, so they adapt here uh, Raven's burnt out desert landscape as an intimate environment for a four hour collaboration. Over and over again, they come and come and reach for each other with Raven's earlier warning takes on a specificity previously unheard of in Eiko and Koma's repertoire. And though Eiko really insisted to me that was all David's idea, that wasn't me, uh, I can't help but observe that the soundtrack really um, made explicit these linkages that had always been there implicitly in their work. Now since um, since 2014, Eiko has been engaged in solo work that started because Coma had an ankle injury and uh, they had a gig. And so somebody just said to Eiko, well, you could do solo. And she said, um, so uh, she did this, uh, this first performance of solo and really loved it so much it's turned into an ongoing project. Um, and this project has really continued those explicit connections across time and space between Fukushima and other places. Um, and uh, there's two aspects to this solo project. One is the photographic collaboration with William Johnston called A Body in Fukushima, which you're seeing some um, shots here. So this is a video that Aiko has edited together of both their photographs and of her live performances, um, which is called, um, that series is called A Body in Places. So Eiko and Johnston, who is a photographer and a Wesleyan University professor of Japanese history, with whom Eiko has co-taught uh, classes on the nuclear bomb, uh, they've been traveling to Tohoku since 2014 to visit swaths of land evacuated due to the radioactive contamination from Fukushima Daiichi. Johnston's large-scale digital prints, and you're seeing some here from their very first trip in 2014, so done uh, five, six cents. Um, his print show Eiko dancing amidst the jumbled context of spilled homes, on train tracks almost obscured by lush ivy, 
and on empty roads now with, with the now calm ocean and the not present tent in the background. And as you can see here, Eiko carries with her in many of these photos a Japanese futon, which she made, and an expanse of red fabric, which is actually the lining from her grandmother's kimono. And she carries these items with her, and which along with her body provide points of connection between the abandoned Fukushima stations and all this uh, evacuated land, and her performances initially in the Philadelphia Amtrak station, where the initial uh, performance was scheduled. But since then, she's performed in the streets of New York, Wesleyan University, uh, where she was taught ambulance since 2006, but also in Hong Kong at the sites of the student protests. She performed in public Ruta's house and many, many other places as well. In the program notes for the very first performances in Philadelphia, Eiko wrote, quote, I want my body to be a conduit that connects the grandeur of 30th Street Station to the desolation of abandoned stations in Fukushima. Through a body, memory, and imagination, distance is malleable, end quote. Elsewhere, she has said, quote, what if I dig a hole into the Philadelphia train station's marble floor, as if digging a well for water, and that hole goes and reaches to Fukushima? Then it is like a hole that is the perfect thing in the world and has to be And we should all be so lucky as to have a, a brand new career when we're in our 60s. Um, the impact of her solo body uh, both in the photographs and in the live performances, it's really quite different than uh, Eiko and Koma's bodies together. As a duo, they often morph into each other or into another entity altogether. They exist in their own worlds. But alone, Eiko is human, relatable, an interloper in everyday spaces. Watching her careen through the Philadelphia station, pick her way down the New York City street, search desperately through a library, or descend a staircase in a subway station, we call to mind for audience members memories of their grandmother, their own feelings of loneliness as they're searching, or even images of, of refugees searching for a safe haven. Whatever the specific meaning for each person encountering in these places, the fact of her presence on these same streets, staircases, aisles, alongside yet apart, please have the Amtrak train information located at the center of the station. Her solo work asks people those who specifically come to see her, and also just people who happen to pass them by, to really take notice of where they are. In asking themselves what she is doing, they might find themselves asking what other people are doing there, as well as what other people might have passed before. Her surprising presence invites empathy and connection. Her collaborator Johnston puts it this way, for me, Eiko's performances make visible the anguish of the people and other living beings who've suffered from the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown and allow us to bear witness with a kind of intimacy that otherwise remains on the margin. Many have forgotten or want to forget the fact that the disaster is ongoing and will be for a long time. With a body in places, Eiko directly addresses these issues of nuclear power and the environment in a way that she and Koma never did so explicitly. And when I asked her about this, she told me, quote, Fukushima is like an exemplary disaster. Everything that wasn't supposed to happen, happened. It's so clearly a demonstration that we fail, humans fail. By corporeally working through the crisis in the and bringing evidence of that process in the form of the body, the cloth, the and, and the photographs into a place ostensibly untouched by the crisis, this was a body series meets the bodies of the tens of thousands who died in the and the hundreds of thousands of fled the city of that Noble and familiar. And the accumulation of all these very hard places and all these very everyday places that we dance there. Ask people to question the relationship between their daily lives, the top figures every day, the streets they walk down, and how it may be connected to Fukushima and to other aging nuclear power plants. For example, like Indian Point, which is the power plant that's the point that I in Manhattan, and where it was also the So just as a way to conclude, I want to say that across the span of Eiko and Koma's body of work, the choreographers have created dances that combine the specificity of sites with these non-specific narratives of destruction and regeneration in a way that's 
capable of connecting a nature event like 9 11 or Fukushima to other cycles of death in your life. In these dances, there are no towers or no bombs, only bodies. Bodies that struggle, stab, push away, pull closer, awkwardly caress, collapse, and recover. There are bodies that take tender care of one another, bodies that take care. Bodies that interest you not look away, but you take care Well, their choreography leaves room for audience members to bring their own and take the experience to bear in their own and their own series. Their linking of ground zero is a cross-town and state, the point of alliances among specific people and public sites is a way of making the series accepted and pictures of it to be The dancers like the ones I described today, Ace and Tama open up spaces that they can't grant and yet local and internet, both performers and audience members alike, and both students and students. Thank you so much for this um, really amazing talk. Um, I was struck by um, a couple of things you said about Aiko, and um, I'm curious to hear more about her as a female performer because some of the videos you showed, um, she was naked, um, up her upper body, and mm -hmm. to me that was just a striking contrast with what you mentioned, that she was the one actually speaking for the duo most mm -hmm. of the time. So her position as a woman who's performing in some ways, rock I'm curious what you think about the mm. na nakedness, but then yeah. also contrasts with the fact that she's the mouthpiece as an mm -hmm. Asian American or Japanese um, woman. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's important. And you didn't really talk about gender, but I'm sure you talk about it in your mm -hmm. larger projects. So I'm curious to learn more. Yeah. It's a really interesting question. Um, so two things. Uh, one, I'll address uh, the issue of nudity first. Uh, actually, in across their body of work, they perform nude quite a lot. Um, and yeah, coincidentally, I think this is, these are pieces when only Aiko is, is topless. Um, but they have, you know, they have significant work in which they're both naked. Um, and, and, and fragile, actually, you couldn't tell um, from, the, um, from the video, I think, that they were both naked. And I think that, the, you know, this um, was through doing the retrospective project and a lot of conversations we had that Aiko really started to articulate that for them, um, nakedness is not nudity. So often they're using their... Um, they see themselves as using their naked bodies as, um, you know, often we think of nudity as, as like being very vulnerable, as it like exposing ourselves, but for them it, it in some way um, feels like it's becoming uh, less individual and more they can be, their bodies can be other things. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, Aiko herself would say like, you know, even from when she was young, like that she was not a typical, um, you know, young Japanese woman who was, you know, she was always like very verbal and uh, like in her family, I guess um, her really interesting family, um, some of her, her father's, so her grandfather and his brothers were these kind of like very working class, but like iconoclast artists as well. Like they, their father was a printmaker, but then they were like winning these awards and they had, but they hadn't gone to school. And they were, so she has a lot of rebels in her kind of lineage. Um, so I think her family, like even when she was young, she told me they would say, oh, you're, that's just otake, you're, you're otake. Um, so she's always been like that. I think she felt like once she came to the U.S. and she um, had, um, as she articulated it, even Manja Schmiel in, in Germany had a number of older Jewish women as mentors, and she felt like she really connected with these women who, um, who were like her, very verbal and very um, strong and outgoing and um, so yeah, she has in that sense um, always been a Koma's kind of like background vision guy. He's always like thinking about sets and kind of like, oh, you're here. The Aiko's very, if you ever meet her, she like talks a mile a minute and is like very active. Um, so yeah, I think that's um, the really interesting things you're picking up on there. Yeah. advantage of having the mic. <laughs> so one of the things I was noticing um, watching the videos was actually the way the audience was interacting with these pieces and how we went from early stuff like fission or 
it's not fission revisited, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> event fission. Yeah, uh -huh. event fission, where we see the audience really directly kind of watching this to these really later videos uh -huh. where it's always mediated through their phones or, uh -huh. you know, their tablets or this, th it's being filmed. Yeah. And I was wondering if they are, uh -huh. um, if Echo and Coma are in some ways playing with that too, because that you can imagine could also be part of this destabilization of place as a single thing. Mm, um, mm. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah. Um, I'm just jotting it down. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's certainly, it's, it's interesting to like think about event vision where there wasn't that kind of technology and there was certainly like one camera, maybe, maybe two, I'm not sure. Um, and then, uh, you know, a photographer or two um, who were hired specifically, right? Where then you get to, I mean, I remember the first time I really noticed it was at the Philadelphia train check and like just seeing everybody coming by or like people walking by, stopping, oh my, what's going on? Filming for a minute and then going about on their business. And I really started to wonder about like, where is that video traveling now, right? Um, are they sharing it with friends? Does it just stay on their phone? Do they put it on Facebook and say, oh, I saw this weird lady this morning, um, which always, um, I mean, ECHO, from the beginning of their site-specific work, has talked about um, kind of wanting, like, almost more than the, the audience that comes intentionally, like, really wanting that person who would kind of stumble upon it and be like, what's happening here and what, what that effect could have on somebody? So, yeah, I think that there's, like, there's so many questions about this, the way that you can now just, so many people are filming it, and, like, the film captures everybody else capturing it, right? So, yeah, where do then those videos all travel to and how does that take the, the dance to even more places. I think um, I haven't talked to Aiko a lot about that. I know that for her platform series, um, when she was doing these little performances in lower Manhattan, like she would do like lunchtime, like kind of 50 minute, 45 minute things for like 20 people. Um, they would do like little postcards, video postcards that they would post and so it talked about how, cause she loves editing video and she really, um, like everything I've shown she's edited. Um, so talking about like how that was a new thing in, in her repertoire and she said, well that came from the producer. They, they thought that would be a good idea but I think it was like the, her thinking of video in a, in a new way like that they could, you could send a little postcard like, hey, I was here and it would be a short little video. Um, so I think they're just starting to think about the implications of this kind of thing in their work. Yeah. Nico had a question. <laughs> um, does uh, Eiko give uh, interviews in English or mm -hmm. Japanese? So this was English, her, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the titles, do they provide a bilingual title? Because I saw Offering had a Japanese title, mm -hmm. Kuyo. And to me, those two are different, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So I was wondering if... Mm above and beyond dance as a, their expression, but the title, how do they think yeah. about title and then working in between different languages, mm -hmm. if you can comment on that. That's a great question. Um, so um, when they, well, first of all, they're for like the first five years of their careers, they called all their dances white dance. Um, they're just like, this is, this is our dance, this is what it is. And so you can see kind of there, you know, if you know anything about Buto, originally it was Ankoku Buto, so in Dance of Darkness. So um, by calling their dance, you know, leaving Japan and calling their dance white dance, it feels like a, you know, we're doing something different. And you see the color white then come back, for example, in Event Vision with a white flag. Um, but um, so when they moved to the U.S., um, they always were very um, interested in these very short titles. I think their longest title is maybe Before the Cock Crows, and that was like their third piece. And after that, you know, their titles are things like Grain, River, Lament, um, you know, Wind. Very um, simple words. So Aiko um, once uh, told me, you know, she wanted, because her own English is not fluent, and I mean, she's, you know, has lots and lots of English, but, you know, she'll say, you know, as a, as a second language learner, she wanted to have titles that were very simple that everybody could understand. Um, in my experience, they didn't start adding Japanese titles until they did their retrospective project. And that's when she put a lot of these things online. 
Um, you know, honestly, their career is, m is much more in the US and in Europe than in Japan. Um, when I was in Japan doing research, um, a lot of people would say to me, oh, you know, Eikon Koma, they're really American. But of course, American presenters keep trying to say that they're Japanese, but they've been here for, for you know, two thirds of their lives. They've lived in New York. Eikon Koma say they're New Yorkers more than anything else. But um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting issue, the issues of translation and yeah. Thank you so much for this incredibly rich talk. And um, I, I think I have a, a kind of related question about this notion of, of mourning mm -hmm. translation. And, and um, since you, you have um, such a deep knowledge of their movement vocabulary, I was kind of wondering, I guess, two things. One is, um, in your uh, experience with their work, to what extent has their movement vocabulary changed? And uh, insofar as so many of the pieces seem to be in some ways either explicitly or implicitly about this notion of mourning, mm -hmm. but something like Kuyo is not necessarily, it might be related, but can, might be read as an offering as opposed to mourning mm -hmm. per se. And, I, and I, I think I would want to unpack that a little bit more and hear, you know, um, either in their opinion or in your opinion as a scholar of dance, mm -hmm. kind of how that movement vocabulary has changed. And if they're, they are really differentiating between the different sites on the, I mean, insofar as one of the things they seem to be trying to do is to connect these sites and presumably in terms of movement motifs that might recur, that, that that would be really central to that kind of political project. I'm just wondering where the specificity comes in. It seems like certain fabrics might do that, even mm -hmm. though the movement vocabulary stays the same. Mm -hmm. And um, and then to what extent um, they're aware of their own mortality mm -hmm. um, in mm -hmm. terms of the media practices that are changing mm -hmm. specifically, because I think that, um, so right now, um, Yasuko Yokoshi is, is here as part of the dance residency, and she I was talking to her about Eiko and Koma, and she said, um, you know, one of the things that's been interesting is how the Bhutto establishment doesn't recognize them. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's that kind of tension there and that kind of hierarchy. And so mm -hmm. since your answer to the previous yeah. question kind of marks that d directly, if you could say a little bit more about, um, you know, what it means to be aware of this and trying to, in some ways, unlike other dancers who are worried very mm -hmm. much about this notion of the proprietary nature of, of dance and mm -hmm. things being stolen and appropriated, particularly, I think, mm -hmm. Asian dancers and Japanese dancers, um, you know, how their position within that kind of dance scene actually might allow them to be freer or kind mm -hmm. of want to have different desires with relation to how their work circulates. Yeah, Ooh, a lot in that question. So um, I'm gonna tease out three different threads. One, I'll maybe start with this kind of relationship to Bhutto establishment and their position and relationship to that. And then uh, this issue of mourning and mourning offering and the connection there. And then also kind of this idea of the movement vocabulary. Um, so one, I think, you know, as I said, Akon Koma has never called their work Bhutto. They actually used to issue a statement to presenters for many years about why they didn't want to do that. Um, and they really talked about, you know, we honor our teachers, but we don't want our, our dance to be marked with a specific word, especially because um, that word comes with so many associations that and if people don't have all the information to read that word in a specific way, like in its avant-garde context, and its particular political and artistic context, then, um, then it can be like, oh, uh, it's Japanese. You know, it's like, so they're kind of trying to avoid kind of an essentialism with it. Um, and also, you know, they really, um, they intentionally left Japan at a certain point. They're, you know, I think it's, um, they're very um, still like this very kind of resistant stubbornness to them. They were very close to Kazuono until he died. Um, uh, so that relationship was always very close, but they really also talk about um, the, how they never wanted to be disciples of either Hijikata or Ono, so that their relationship with Ono was very different than his other disciples, for, for example. Um, so I think that they're, um, that's something that they've always really tried to um, negotiate in a particular way and keep it at an arm's length. Um, you know, the issue of mourning is, you know, it recurs throughout their, um, their body of work. I have two chapters in my book around mourning because it's so significant. Um, and for them, um, so when they did the piece offering, it's also tied, you know, a lot of their pieces, like as you can see, like they'll do one piece and then they'll kind of change it maybe for a different venue or a different um, uh, um, opportunity, but those themes will continue. And they really, Eiko says, you know, we don't, um, we're not broad, but we go deep. The things that we're interested in, we go deep. So they had been doing this, um, uh, they had a, fr a friend, a very close friend who had passed away um, and, and had had cancer. And when she was um, ill with cancer, um, they went and danced for her in her room. 
And that experience was very, became very important to them. And they actually had a, a project where they were dancing um, in a hospital as well. So they were dancing for other terminally ill patients. Um, so for them, they were really working on this idea of dance as an offering. And so offering is connected to mourning very much. And I think originally um, that piece before 9-11 was supposed to be called Coffin Dance, where they really wanted to sort of like put death um, front and center because they really say, you know, we don't want to look away from death. We want to, by mourning, we, we acknowledge that death is ubiquitous, right? And they said, well, after 9-11, we don't need to do that because that's happened. What can we do? We can make this as an offering. So there's certainly, a, for them, a very close connection between dance as an offering and mourning. Um, even though they're not exactly the same thing. And, um, you know, in some ways their movement vocabulary has changed. In some ways they, they really, um, in my book, I really talk about them recycling um, because they're very interested in revisiting something and seeing what, what is still there of interest to them and how, you know, in their bodies that are 20, 40 years older, um, how does that change? Um, how does that feel different? Um, so they're really interested in, in revisiting movement vocabulary and using it again. Um, and both, like, as I said, it's sort of, what does this feel like in our aging body? What does this look like in our aging bodies? But then also um, in terms of, you know, being aware of their own mortality, I think, you know, they're, you know, Coma's turning 70 this year. Um, he, you know, he had an ankle injury that persisted for a number of years. He just started dancing again last year. Um, Aiko definitely is like, thinks of herself as, an old woman, but then both of their mothers are still living and they're, and they're both caring for their elderly mother. So they, I think they think about all these things a lot and it kind of weaves through. Mm. Um, so just a, I don't know if this is working, just a quick question. Mm. Um, one of the things that struck me in the performances was the different degrees of um, intimacy and proximity mm. with the audience. Yeah. And by, by the time we got to Aiko's solo performances, one of the last times, mm -hmm. it was almost the one in the light filled mm -hmm. basement. Yeah, Fulton Street basement. Yeah. It was almost like the most of theater, yeah. and the audience was changed in the way mm -hmm. she performed with her because she was on top of that. <laughs> um, so I wondered if she sort of moved intentionally in that direction. Have they ever, um, you know, in their site specific performance, have they ever? Moved into something that's closer to um, in immersion. Mm. It's a great question. I think you know the issue is that um, certainly they've often performed in great proximity to other um, to the audience, um, but when they're a duo and, and for you know there's only a handful of pieces and they've made like you know probably over 50 works at, by this point. There's only a handful of pieces where it's not just the two of them. So really when it's the two of them, they often form their own world in their pieces. And so they're not often really even making direct eye contact with audience members. And, but Eiko Solo, and I've talked to her a lot about this, that because she is just, it's just herself, she has really felt um, an impetus and a desire to reach out more. And so she has been very intentionally um, making eye contact, seeking contact, moving into those spaces. And I think some of the nature of the spaces um, uh, she's really used that to her advantage. I mean, sometimes she's performing in like little tiny bookstores or things like that where you, you're going to be very close to her. But in that situation, right, I mean, she um, chose to move into the crowd. And of course, the crowd can move away from her. But it's really interesting to be an audience member watching another audience member making decisions about, do I stay? Do I accept this intimacy from her and with her? Do I back away? And it's always interesting to, to see when those moments happen. Um, but I think it's something she's really um, curious about now and seeking out more um, to really be um, in the middle of things. There's other video where she's like, you know, in the middle of Wall Street and there's like, you know, business people and tourists and like all sorts of things happening, you know, street workers and, you know, so I think she's really kind of enjoying um, having these different kinds of interactions with audiences. Thank you. So I think if we stay in this classroom any longer, we're going to be in the oh. middle of another interaction <laughs> that maybe not everybody wants. So, um, <laughs> but please do join me uh, one more time in thanking Rosemary. Mm -hmm.